easier. And it's so much more efficient to study your Bible that way. So we're going to do that. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And most of all, we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us and take us home to glory. We thank you for it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So the title of my message is, Must Believers Keep the Sabbath? And I can tell you that there aren't any believers that can keep the Sabbath, and there aren't any unbelievers that can keep it either. So even if they think they're keeping the Sabbath, they're not. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we're going to do a little bit of... uh, Make a little room here. Uh, Genesis chapter 1. And we'll start with the, with the basics in the beginning because uh, we're going to make a connection here that I want you to see concerning the Sabbath and the seventh day. And I want you to see this connection because it's very important. Now, a day in your Bible is identified in Genesis chapter 1, verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light and that... It was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, my wife has a little boy, Noah, in the uh, Sunday school class that she teaches. Noah was born into the church there, and he's, he's just over three, and uh, wonderful little guy. And he asked my wife, while she was teaching him about the creation days, where's the sun? And she said, well, God hadn't made it yet. And he took the crayon, he scribbled a yellow circle and put a little couple of lines around it. He goes, okay, there it is. <laughs> He's learning, okay? And this is where you start. And God called the night day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Normally, a day in the Bible is what we call the normal day that we have, the working day, six days a week, and so forth. A day can also be 40 years, like in the day of provocation. It can also be about a special event, like the day of the Lord, or the Lord's day, as it says in Revelation. Some people call Sunday the Lord's day. And uh, so that's kind of a, a term. You might see the word, you know, day used in the, like the day of judgment or whatever. So a day can can be a different period of time in the context but in general it starts in the evening and it goes to the next evening so that's how god reckons time we do it a little differently we start at midnight and go around again to midnight but uh really god's way is the evening and the morning are the first day so we're going to talk about for whom was the sabbath intended what is the message of the sabbath what do we learn from it what's its purpose and should the body of christ observe the Sabbath. And so uh, let's let's go back to over just a little bit over to Genesis chapter two and look at verse one. Moses writes the thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. So there you see that he ceases from the work. He ends it, which identifies what the word rest really means. When you see rest, it wasn't he was tuckered out. He was not tired from this. He ceases from his work, and he is going to do something here that is going to set a precedent for eternity. The the Sabbath is not, uh, it is a dispensational issue, but in the Bible, it is an eternal issue with God. So on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So he sets it apart for a specific purpose. <clears throat> and as you begin to, to, to recognize this, you see that this thing takes with it uh, some, some details and, and some things that are going to eventually be ascribed to the nation of Israel. If you go over to, it is God's finished creation. Look at Exodus. Go with me, if you will, over to Exodus. Just go to the right a little bit and go to Exodus chapter 16. Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. 
Exodus 16 and verse 23. And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to keep until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning, and Moses bade, as Moses bade, and it did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. Uh, I'm in Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. And so they're showing, he's showing them how that they're going to take a double portion of manna now. They're going to store it, which they were not supposed to do on a daily basis. And they're going to take it and store it up for the Sabbath day. And it will not rot. It will not smell. And that was kind of the, you know, the member of the ones that tried to take more and they took it in the tent and it just smelled their tent all up. And he says, I told you, it's not going to work that way, right? So he, he goes through here and he explains this. And Moses said in verse 25, eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today ye shall not find it in the field. Six days ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So in the six-day work week that Israel has, they part of that work is gathering the manna. So they gather on six days, and if they don't do that, they're not going to have any on the Sabbath day. So they're to make ready. They're to prepare for the Sabbath day every day of the week. It's part of that. Every day it's going to come new. You've got to get it while it's new and so forth. And there's going to be a time in which it's going to, at the end of the week, they're going to gather double, and then it's going to be there for the Sabbath. But they're working through that whole week. Six days, he says, ye shall gather it. But on the seventh day, uh, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. So they get their daily stuff every day of the week, and then uh, when it gets towards the end of the week, they're going to take the double portion. Verse 27, And it came to pass that they went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. And the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? Verse 28, For he says, See, for that the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore he giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days, Abide ye every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna, and it was like coriander seed, white and taste was, uh, was like wafers made with honey. And so here you see them, and it is becoming a requirement. It is part of their rest day for them to not only rest and not do any servile work but that they should gather the food and so forth look at exodus chapter 20 and you see that the sabbath plays a very important part it is the fourth commandment of the ten commandments and it is a blessed and hallowed day it is a holy reminder for israel of a finished creation the creation was finished and all the hosts rejoice, and this is now something that is to be reminded, uh, or is reminding for Israel to them. Now, if you turn over to Exodus 20, also, if you would, go right on over to Numbers chapter 15, and you can take that as well, and we'll look at both of these together, save a little time. And you, you can see that it's a blessed and hallowed day, and in the Ten Commandments, you see uh, the, the whole, really, moral the moral code for most of the world today, even though the, not all people are Jewish, not all people are Christian, but even with that, most people around the world agree and, and subscribe to the basic tenets of the Ten Commandments. Some of them they don't, but, but most of them will tell you, you know, uh, can I take your stuff? And they'll say, no, don't steal it. They disagree with you, you know. They say, hey, wait a minute, you can't have my stuff. Somebody put up on uh, line the other day the, the Ten Commandments, but it was it was a hillbilly version. I hope you saw that. I laughed pretty hard on that one. So, you know, don't take my stuff. That was that was the one on this one. So if if you look at it, it says this. He says, "Remember the Sabbath day." Verse eight, uh, Exodus twenty, verse eight. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor. And do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou 
nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. This sounds very strange to people today. They, they, they cannot comprehend. They're so busy with their evolutionary thinking, and they're so busy with falsely so-called sciences that they're trying to follow. And yet, when it gets down to verse 13, thou shalt not kill, they agree with that one. They pick that one right out of the hat. They want to keep that one. When it comes to thou shalt not commit adultery, they said, well, I'm on the fence with that one, you know, because it's, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. And then the other one, thou shalt not steal. Almost everybody says, don't touch my stuff, right? So they take and pick and choose. But right there in among those Ten Commandments, notice what it says. Verse 11, for in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. They cannot stomach that verse. They cannot bear it. They can't take it because it goes against everything they've ever been taught. When I ask a young man who came to our church, he hadn't been over, he hadn't been over here from Ukraine probably more than a few weeks and he was in my Sunday school class and I was trying to get to know, the, there was four of these children and I was trying to get to know them and find out exactly what it is they believed and what they were taught over in, in, uh, in the Soviet Union area and, and in re Ukraine and he said, uh, he was trying to explain, he says, uh, well, he, he didn't quite know how to say it because he's learning English, okay, so he's saying it, he says, uh, he basically said, well, they taught us we came from monkeys. That's what he said. And he says, we came from monkeys. That's all he knew. I said, that's all you've got? He says, yeah, just monkeys. That's it. <laughs> and I said, okay, you, you, if that's what you think, that's fine. I hope you don't believe that, you know. And I, watched, I had the pleasure of watching all four of those children get saved. And it was a, it was a wonderful time with them. But they, they did not know. When we went to Bulgaria with Nick back in 2006, we were passing out the Am I Going to Heaven track. And people over there, they could read English, and Macedonia especially. And, but when they, Nick was explaining to me that over there, and this is true of the Soviet language, when they talk about heaven, they mean sky. Look up in the sky and see the airplane. They, they think that is heaven. Well, it is. It's the firmament. It is one of the heavens. But, but we don't think of heaven that way. We're asking them, do you know if you're going to go to heaven or not? Meaning have eternal life with God in the heavenly places, right? And people over there, weren't, they, they don't understand that. They, they, they were having a little trouble trying to figure out why you were asking them if they're going to go up into the sky, you know. So you, it's a language thing. And so people kind of pick and choose what they want when they want it. And, uh, and so you see that this is a problem. Turn over to num Numbers chapter 14. Now, I want to know, for all the Jehovah's Witnesses and all of the Seventh-day Adventists and all of the other people in the world, uh, the entire Jewish group population that go to the synagogues uh, on the Sabbath day, I want to know why it is that you don't see the news coverage about the stonings. Why is that not happening? They say that they're keeping the Sabbath. What they mean is we're going to church. That's what they mean. That's what they're primarily going to do. They're going to go and study and do things and do the rituals and stuff like that. And they go and they're trying to keep something that belongs to somebody else. However... There is a consequence. If you're going to take something, you must take the consequences along with it, right? So if you're going to be Pentecostal, you need to sell what you have. If I ask you for something and I say, you need to give that to me according to this verse, then I'm asking for it. You're supposed to give it to me. I asked a man about this when I, uh, I had uh, poured out some toluol. I don't know if you know what that is. It's a real strong solvent in my shop. And we're talking about this. He came up in a station wagon and started talking to me in the, out in the area where I was working. And, and I was younger. And uh, we began to talk about the Bible and all these things. And he was kind of Pentecostal and he was talking about the healings and all this stuff. So I just took a can. I poured that tell you on. I said, here, have a drink of that. Go to Mark 16. And we started talking about that. He says, no, you're tempting God. You can't do that. I said, well, the verse says these signs shall follow them that believe. Do you believe? Yes. Well, can you drink that? I don't want to drink that. I said, okay. So give me your car. I want your station wagon. <laughs> you got two coats? I want one of them. Yours happens to be a Ford. Okay. And so as you see the station wagon sitting there, the young man that was with him, he's getting a little nervous because I got the Bible. We're outside now on a, on a big work table, and I've got my Bible out. We're working on this. And he says, 
I, I said, I want your station wagon. Give me the keys because I need a good station wagon. Could you give me that station wagon? I'm asking you as one Christian to another, okay, one man to another, I need that station wagon. You're supposed to give it to me if I ask you for it. And the boy, the young man, he's a teenager, he says, how are we going to get home? <laughs> I said, he believes the word, but evidently you don't, you know. So we finally got around to the gospel and start talking about those things. I want to know, when people start saying they're Sabbath keepers, why aren't there more reports of people being stoned? Why isn't there? Surely they're not all keeping the Sabbath every day. Israel couldn't keep it at all. Why, how, how are they going to keep it? You know, And even if you had a Sabbath day to keep today, you couldn't keep it either. The penalty for it, uh, as it is with adultery, is a capital crime under the law. There it is. It's back, right back there in Exodus 20. You can see it. Numbers chapter 15, take a look at this verse. Numbers 15, verse 32. Numbers 15, 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in a ward. They jailed him because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died as the Lord commanded Moses. It is a capital crime to break the Sabbath. In this country alone, in the early days, during the revolutionary days, if you got caught working in your shop or working in, in, in not observing the Sabbath, they would jail you or put you in stocks or some other form of punishment. We've had it, you know, it's a very strong thing. And in those days, it was not uh, cultic groups. It wasn't just uh, Seventh-day Adventists or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever. It was all of them, okay, the, the pilgrims and, and all the other, you know, English groups that were over here that were being Christian people. They believed that you had to keep the Sabbath. Now, the problem is, is, they were keeping it on the wrong day, okay? So they're swapping their, their things around. If you, if you look, that the, it is compulsory except for the priests because on the Sabbath day they work. They offer the sacrifice. They do the things that have to be done for the services to the people. The Levites serve the rest of the tribe. So it's not compulsory for them to keep it. They're going to work on that day. And then there are some special circumstances that you can see. Turn over to Mark chapter 2, and we'll take a look at some of these, just a couple of them real quick. You want to see that there are circumstances that can be uh, cited, and we're going to do that right now. Look at, uh, go to Mark. And go to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. And verse 23, Mark 2, 23. And it came to pass that he went through the corn fields on the Sabbath day, and his disciples began as they went to pluck the ears of corn. And the Pharisees said unto him, Behold, why do they on the Sabbath day that which is not lawful? And he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he had need, and when hungered he uh, and they that were with him? How he went into the house of God in the days of Abithar, the high priest, and did eat the showbread, which is not lawful to eat, but it's for the priest, he says, and gave also to them which were with him. They were being chased. They were running for their lives. They run into the tabernacle and they eat the showbread. They're trying to survive. And there's an exception given. Verse 27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, there's a good clue there for you. This is an institution. It is not in the sense of an organizational institution, but it is a memoriam. It is a sanctified holy day. It is a covenant with Israel and it is eternal. And so you see that this Sabbath day is going to be kept in, in, in perpetuity from now on. It's, it's very serious. And he says, therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So the exception is, hey, um, in case you hadn't believed this, but uh, I'm your Messiah. 
I'm not only the son of God, I'm God the son. And I am the king of Israel. And he is the son of man. And he comes and that cornfield was his. And the air those guys were breathing, that's his. All of it's his. Every bit of it. So he's the Lord, okay, of the Sabbath. He says, therefore, the son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So compare that now, if you will. Go, turn over to Luke chapter 14. And you can see. I like this verse here because it, it contains a phrase that that is uh, kind of interesting. Look at uh, Luke chapter 14. And here's a little bit different angle on it, but it, it's a little different uh, situation. But in chapter Luke 14, verse 1, and it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him and behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy and Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace and he took him and healed him and let him go and answered them saying, which of you have an ass or an oxen or an ox fall into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? Wouldn't you do that for your own ox? Wouldn't you do that for your own donkey? Wouldn't you do that? He says, and they could not answer him again to these things. You see, when, when you start examining this, you, you understand the Sabbath is made for man. And certainly the man here that has the dropsy benefits from the Lord's ministry on the Sabbath day. There is an issue with this. Turn over to, to uh, Romans chapter 2, if you will. I want you to look at this passage because dispensationally, uh, this is bring, starts bringing us into the area that we need to understand how to cope with this issue when somebody tries to bring this up and they're keeping the Sabbath. Uh, but I, I want to say that uh, regardless of what they think they're doing, they're not keeping it because it's not even in, it's not even in play today in the dispensation of grace. Look at uh, Romans chapter 2, and Paul ends chapter 2 with a, a really a beautiful summation. And he says in verse 28, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. If these men had understood the difference between the spirit of the law and the letter of the law, they they also along with believing who he was, may have looked at that and said, wow, that's a good credential. He's healing. That's one of his credentials. So when Jesus is healing people, that's a demonstration. I am the son of David. I am the king of Israel. I am here to show you who I am. And he heals the sick and he raises the dead and he does these things. And that was part of his credentials. The Sabbath day was made for man. It was made for Jewish men. It was made for Jewish families. It was made for those in the nation of Israel and those that were proselytes. The concept behind this seventh day is that it's looking forward to a time in history over here where you see the kingdom of heaven showing up and that, that kingdom of heaven is a representation and the Sabbath day is a representation one of another. So as, they, as you look at this, you see that this is all going to be part of Israel's day of rest. When you read about him in, in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 1, they call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So it's about God coming down. The kingdom of heaven is, is, is the kingdom from heaven on the earth. It descends from heaven and it comes to earth. That's how it gets here. And so that's the idea with Israel. Turn back to Exodus chapter 19. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go to, just go over to chapter, chapter 25 of Matthew. That's closer. We'll go there. Matthew chapter 25. I want to show you that while the kingdom doesn't officially get entered into detail until 2 Samuel chapter 7 with the Davidic covenant and the, and the whole idea of the Davidic throne, it is something that goes all the way back to the foundation of the world. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. You're in the middle of the, the judgment of the nations here in verse 32. 
uh, Matthew 25, 32, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats, and he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Is it not been promised since the foundation of the world? Yes, it is. I mean, you can see Enoch, the seventh from Adam, preaching about the second coming of Jesus Christ so powerfully that they want to kill him. He's the seventh man from Adam, and he's preaching about the, the, the Lord coming back. It's a fantastic thing when you see that you, you, you realize now that you, you can now tie the entire kingdom program all the way back to the seventh day. When God rested on the seventh day, he's showing them a weekly reminder of the fact that he is going to dwell with them. And, of course, we know now people think that we're created in the image of God when in reality we're created in the image of Adam. And Adam uh, messed things up in such a way that uh, the kingdom couldn't get set up back then and, and he could not become that prophet, priest, and king. And there was, a, there was some issues with all that. And so the thing continues on, and some 6,000 years later, here we are, in a parenthesis, kind of a holding pattern. I went to Tampa International on Tuesday, and I, I was checking in at the kiosk, and uh, the thing came up. It said, flight canceled. I said, what? You know. I said, yeah, there's a plane sitting at O'Hare, and they won't let it go because of mechanical problems, and uh, it can't get down here. I said, well, call them back and tell them to keep it there because I don't want to get on it. Okay. <laughs> so they put me on a puddle jumper, a turboprop, over to Jacksonville, and in the process of that, we left a little late, but we got over there. And the, every time the pilot would make an announcement, he started getting more nervous and more nervous and more nervous because we found ourselves uh, flying into a, an airport that was socked in with a whole bunch of thunderclouds around it and thunderstorms. And, and, and here we are circling this thing, right? And seven or eight times we went around this, and he says, uh, there's a hole there. We're going to try to make it in. <laughs> I said, a little sunshine does not get rid of crosswinds. You know, I, I know that. And so he says, uh, no, I think we're going to, we got another report. I think we're going to go around a couple more times. I'm thinking, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> I've never seen this man, okay? He's in the cockpit when I got in the plane. But they did tell us that we have such a light load that everybody has to sit back behind aisle seven because the plane's no heavy. I said, well, thank you for sharing that with me. <laughs> and so as we're flying around, and we're bumping, and we're flying, and so we're going to make the final approach. And I said, well, I said, Lord, it's now or never. Here it is. You know, I'm ready. And, and so we go in, and all of a sudden, we're, we're doing this. You know how they do that when they come in on a plane? Usually it's just a little bit, right? Well, we're doing more than a little bit. And I know if you land like that, it ain't going to work. So uh, it doesn't take a flight engineer to figure that out. But the guy got the thing on the ground, and when I went out, he was, sh he was so shook up when he came out of the cockpit. He says, welcome to Tallahassee. I said, we're in Jacksonville. <laughs> he knew he was going somewhere. But uh, I really should have stopped and asked him where he was going, whether he was going to heaven or not. But I just patted him on the back. I said, thank you for getting me down, okay? And so... That was kind of how my day was going on, on Tuesday coming up here. I was in a holding pattern like we're right, right here, okay? And, and that holding pattern is, is the dispensation of the grace of God. Israel has this e eternal sign and covenant, and this is for them, and it is not for us. It is about their rest with God. It is about God in a perpetual habitation with them. He's going to dwell with them. And to them, it's God with us, Emmanuel. He's going to live with us. And they, they have the Feast of Tabernacles where they celebrate that. And they all come out and they set up these little kind of uh, lean-tos and they call booths. You know, they, they, they sit and, and they have this whole feast, part of these feasts and tabernacles is to celebrate that fact. And, of course, then they have the Sabbath each week to remind them of that. And so there is a real connection between the creation and the finishing of it and the Sabbath day, they're inexorably joined. Israel's kingdom is about, uh, Israel's message is about the kingdom of heaven. 
And that's what it's all about. That's its purpose. The kingdom of heaven on the earth will come. How many of you ever stood in a church and said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth? You know, yada, yada, yada. You just keep going through that whole thing. And, uh, you know, whenever I go to places, I went to a, a Catholic funeral here recently, and uh, somebody had passed away, and I was just there as a guest, and they're saying the Lord's Prayer, and they're going through all these things, and, and they're doing all this, and I'm just standing there, and I'm going, what am I doing in here, you know? And at the same time, you know, I, I had to remind myself, as Paul says, the idol is nothing, okay? It, it's a cult, yes, but... At the same time, uh, I'm here to pay some respects to somebody that had passed away. And uh, I was just there, and, and it just reminded me how important it is to know my Bible and to remember who, who died on the cross for my sins. See, in that place, they had a giant cross with Christ still on it. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't see him that way. Uh, and, and I know Morris out where he lives. You have that, that church down there uh, near you, you where, where they had those three crosses, where we had the conference that year. And uh, they had the Lord hanging out there like that. And he's not there, okay? So, so now we go from time past into but now. So where is Israel? When you're reading through the book of Acts, we were having a discussion last night about the, uh, the mid-Acts position and so forth. And I, I was, you know, as, as you read through the book of Acts and you get through past, you know, around 13, 14, 15, 16, you go on through there and, and, you, and you start realizing somebody's missing. And you get to the end of the book of Acts, and you find out, well, yeah, where's Israel at? Where's the 12 apostles at? And now they're the 11 apostles. What's happening? Where's the little flock? What is going on? Well, God changed where you start the Bible. Because when you get to the end of the book of Acts, the natural thing is to find out, well, okay, so what happened to all these people? Paul leaves, he leaves you there, he's in his own hired house, and he's given the gospel out. That's how it ends. Well, the first step, the first thing you've got to learn is that the book of Genesis isn't written to you or about you. Now, we know that about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We know that about these other books. But, but I, I kept thinking, you know, Genesis is for everybody. Well, it's not. It's not even the Old Testament. You go full book of Genesis and then 20 chapters into Exodus before you get to the Old Testament, which is called the Old Testament, the Testament. So now you, you begin to see that, that starting somebody in Genesis is a bad idea. Because do you know how, what the odds are of them finding themselves to Romans chapter 3 from Genesis 1? No, it's not good. It's very difficult. So the first thing you've got to tell them is get lost. And if you get lost, then you, you, then you can get saved because that's the first thing you're going to have to know before you get saved is that you're lost. And then you receive the Holy Spirit, and he lives inside of you, and he begins to teach you according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And we learn about spiritual things and, and how the Bible is spiritually discerned and that God's, you know, he's, he's doing this through comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. Now, when, when you go through this, you realize as you begin to study, turn over to Romans chapter 11, you begin to see that there's a shift in a couple of different things. First of all, the kingdom has been postponed. And uh, first time I ever saw that, when I saw a, a picture of the chart Richard was doing that, I said, the kingdom is postponed. I said, can he do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he can. And look at Romans chapter 11. And look at verse 25. Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. If you think you're a spiritual Jew trying to keep the Sabbath day, and that's a good thing for you, you are blind as a bat. Because he says that blindness in part is happened unto Israel part of the nation of Israel, part of the people today who identify as the nation of Israel, they can get saved, no doubt. But it's just a small part. There's no fast rule about it. But they're not all going to get saved in the dispensation of grace, even though they have the opportunity. What are the chances? But the reason for that is, is they're so stuck in religion 
and they're so messed up, they're dead in trespasses and sins, and now they got religion, and Jude says, when you get in that position, you're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. You're worse than dead. You got religion. If you're just dead in your sins and the trespasses and sins, you can get saved pretty easy. But if you're entrapped in this, then you're going to find yourself mired in the mud and you're not going to be able to get out as easy. I know that some of these things that go on, like keeping the Sabbath and the healing program and all of this stuff, it, what happens to all of this is when you look at it, especially with the, with, with the Seventh-day Adventists and also with the Jehovah's Witnesses, they dangle these things. The Mormons do the same thing. They'll give you a King James Bible free just like that. Okay, But what they're doing with these things, they make issues out of them and they make them very big. And then they dangle them out there like bait and they use them because they're carnal based and they're religious activity, which people like, because no matter what they're doing and how bad it's going, they guarantee you they can prove that they could do it right if they just had another chance. Well, you done had 458,000 chances to do it. How many do you need? You're not going to get righteous on your own. So it draws them in as a bait. And then the more serious doctrines, the Calvinistic type doctrines that teach you that you don't have to believe, that you just, you're chosen and that's it. Or the work your way plan, you know, or whatever it is they're going to sell you. And those things are just, that's the real core of what Satan wants you to believe. He wants to deceive you in such a way that you can be permanently deceived. And yet these other things are kind of, they're kind of secondary things. But boy, those religious trappings, they'll get you. Now, I'm not trying, and ladies, please forgive me. I'm not trying to get rid of Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving or Halloween all separately. I'm going to get rid of them all at once today. I'm going to give you a, I'm going to, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the opportunity to understand something by your own spiritual intelligence that you don't want to know. I talked to a young man at the Motel 6. Richard was talking about the Motel 6, and we're sitting on the rail, and he's trying to to get me to teach him how he's going to get rid of Christmas in his house, you know? And we went through this thing about it, and I said, I told him what I did in in my home and and how that was kind of a failure for a little while. And I I held out for a couple years. We had Christmas, you know, and still had it. We didn't have a tree. He got rid of the tree, you know? But as a result... um, Two or three years after my little girl was born, she, she comes up to me, and her mother sent her out from the kitchen and sent out, sent her out to me. And she's a little blonde-headed thing with big, giant blue eyes and I, or brown eyes. And she said, Daddy, would you get me a Christmas tree? I said, Steve, get up. We're going down to the tree farm right now. <laughs> right down the road. Boy Scouts, we've come home with a tree. I've been, I've been holding on for a while. I'm sharing this with his brother, and he says, well, what about Easter? I said, one thing at a time, brother, one thing at a time. <laughs> no, don't try to get rid of them all at once. But God gets rid of them all at one time, and he does it right there at the cross, and he gets rid of all of them. And so if you turn over to the book of Colossians with me, you will see Paul had a problem with the Colossians with this. He had a problem with the Galatians, too. They're acting like pagans. And uh, the Colossians were doing the same thing. They're not understanding the head. And they did not place the Lord Jesus Christ in the proper position as being the head of the church, the body of Christ. And Paul tells you in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it, the cross. Let no man, listen, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. 
which are, notice, a shadow of things to come. But the body, uh uh-uh, the body is head up by the Lord Jesus Christ, our potentate, okay? He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And while we don't talk about him that way so much, we talk about him with the honor of his name, the Lord Jesus Christ, and and we don't mention it that way so much. Paul just mentions it because he's kind of tying that together in, in, in speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ as the Godhead. He's over all. But to Israel, he's their king. But you know, a head is also a king. <laughs> he's the king, yes, no doubt. He's the old king eternal, he's called. But what happens here is... He's trying to, to, to get these folks to get away from the mysticism and the nonsense and the religious stuff and don't let anybody try to put you under that law. We are not under the law, but under grace. And the first time I wrestled with that verse, I, I kept reading that verse. It said, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And I couldn't make the connection between my sin, and living under grace. Now, that's a horrible place to be. And I was about 20 years old when I was going through this, and I kept reading that verse. I said, Otis, I said, he said, Russ, finish the verse. <laughs> yeah, but it's got dominion over me. He says, yeah, but why? I said, because I'm a sinful person. That's why. He says, yeah, but what are you doing? Where do you live? Where are we? We're in the holding pattern. Sin shall not have dominion over you. That's what it says. For you're not under the law, but you're under grace in the dispensation of grace. In other words, what is being taught right here is the thing that will deliver you from all of these things. We're not under the law, but under grace. No dominion. We're not under carnal ordinances. We are free from the law. Paul says that the, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is simply wherever the law is, death follows. That's it. He says we are not bound by the law. We're loosed from the law. We are delivered from the law. We are to be dead to the law. Just like you're dead to the old man. You've crucified the old man with his affections and lust, and you better quit waking him up. Because the more you wake him up, the more he gets active, and it's like letting the genie out of the bottle. But he's a lot harder to get back in there. It's like little ones. You know, you try to get ten little ones to do something. We saw that last night. It's like herding cats. You can't do it. And once that comes out, and you start reckoning that old man to be alive, you better start reckoning with the sin you're going to be dealing with. Because as soon as you get that old man out, and he's running and working, you're you're done. Your Christian life is going like this. You have to put on Christ and you have to remember who he is. And that connection is with you. You can take the Sabbath and learn this is the creator of heaven and earth. And he's now put us in a position to quit acting like pagans. Paul says to the Galatians, I'm afraid of you. I'm so afraid that everything I've invested in you is for naught. You guys are really causing a lot of trouble. And it's a problem. And so, is that a, is that a beeper going off? Oh. Okay, great. Uh, so when, when you go to Romans chapter 10, you find out that Christ is in the law. He nailed it to the cross. For all those people who are thinking they're going to get righteous by the law, said, no, you think again, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. If you've been thinking it's for righteousness, you've been wrong all along, Okay. It's to condemn you, and it's to teach you about the knowledge of sin. And I don't care how much it points its finger at you, it cannot justify you before God. It's not possible. Putting you under the law and under that condemnation is not going to help you. So when somebody starts putting you on a guilt trip about Christmas, you say Christmas is for Jews, and they, they basically rejected it. And... and uh, that's not something that we're to pick up and go on with, okay? However, if you want a tree and you want to decorate your house and you want to do all that, I'll come over, no problem, because I know it's nothing. 
It's really nothing. Okay? It's just, it's an American tradition. And it's, it's a fun one. And if you, if you train kids up for 10 or 15 years, giving them all this stuff every year on Christmas, you're going to think, well, you're going to have a hard time getting that away from them. First time I ever went to work on Christmas and had to work a Christmas day, I thought it was the end of the world. And I got home and I realized, hey, that was a pretty good day. I had fun. I, I miss Christmas. So what? I was only 16, but I, I, I realized that, you know what? It didn't mean as much as I was putting into it. And uh, that, and, and when I was little, I, I saw my brothers and my dad wrapping my Christmas gifts <laughs> and eating my cookies and milk, and I decided that I don't think this is real, you know. <laughs> I'm getting took. Israel's connection to God through the Sabbath is based on the finished creation of God, the finished creation. And Paul's connection where he says we're to come together on the first day of the week to take the collections, he tells the Corinthians. And he also talks about th- th- this idea of, of coming together uh, on the first day of the week where the brethren are meeting to, to eat and break bread. You find out, well, there is a day for us, but it's the eighth day now, not the seventh. It's the resurrection day. It is not based on the finished creation, It's based on our glorious finished redemption. We look at it in in the terms of the finished redemption, not just the finished creation. That's our connection. Turn to Romans 3, and we'll stop with this verse right here. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Paul says, when you come together on the first day of the week, get the money ready. uh, Rick was talking about it last night. And uh, how the, you know, Paul was a courier. He knew about handling money and taking it from one place to another in the early days of his ministry. And he's basically saying, hey, I'm not going to waste time with you guys waiting around on this. Don't you get it ready and have it when we get there. And I tell you, that was because they kept promising that money for, for over a year and, and, and nothing was getting done. And Paul just said, I'm sending the courier <laughs> to pick it up. Pick up the offering. Romans chapter 3. And look at verse 19. He says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Christ Jesus, of Jesus Christ, excuse me, and unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace, notice, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It is in no other person. It is in no system whatsoever of any kind. It has nothing to do with the religious system. It has to do with you believing in your heart that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and you needed saving. And when you believe that in your heart, you get saved and you will begin to learn that there is absolutely nothing that you could ever possibly do in the flesh to please God. So just cease from trying that. That includes all the holidays, all the holy days, all the whatever, and just let them come and go on the calendar like every other day and appreciate it when you got the day off. It's okay for that. Right? Go ahead and use that. But remember, God isn't speaking to you when he's talking about the Sabbath day. It's a holy, consecrated day, but not for you. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to come and speak and to, and to fellowship with the saints here uh, from all over. And we thank you for that. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.